Okay, so I need to catch you up on what's going on. First, let me introduce you to Connor. Say hello, Connor. Hello. A friend of mine called me up and said they have a robot that they're getting rid of. And do I want a robot? And you should know the answer to that is always yes, you want a robot. So <laughs> I had to pick this thing up by the end of the month and that's why we are in this U-Haul truck. I called my buddy, I said, hey, you wanna learn about robots and help me load this thing? And he said, yes, because you should always say yes to questions like that. And here we are, we got about six plus hours of road trip ahead of us. And I'm gonna bring you along for this journey as we learn about robots and bring Jarvis home a new friend. breaking in here with some exciting news. 3D Experience World is back in session. For those of you who don't know, 3D Experience World is a massive conference. Now they are sponsoring this video today, but this is an event that I attend every year, sponsored or not. There's a huge general session where they tell you about all the new features that are being released this year. They always have a bunch of really smart speakers come in to tell you about some of the incredible things that they're working on. And if you haven't seen the Nerd Stampede, then you are missing out, my friends. As far as my personal experience, the things that I always look forward to is taking the classes. I generally sign up for at least a few classes every day. This is where you improve your CAD modeling skills. You can take classes on things like FEA analysis and it's gonna make you a better engineer. One of the things that I really missed last year when they did it virtually, walking through the hallways and hearing all the different languages, meeting all these people, it's hard to describe how incredible that experience is. I just wanna say, I'm gonna be there and I think you should be there as well. They always have events outside of the main events. So if you wanna socialize, there are many opportunities for that as well. The conference is gonna be February 12th through the 15th, 2023 in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm gonna put this link in the description. So all you have to do is click on it and you can register for the event. But I'm also gonna put a coupon code in there that will allow you to get 50% off of your registration if you sign up using that code. You can also attend the virtual event for free. So if you can't make it to Nashville, you can use that coupon code, take classes online. I don't think it gets much better than free. All right, I hope to see you at the event. The plan is to drive up to Yaskawa's headquarters in Ohio. I'll get a chance to tour the facility. And I also requested if I could meet with one of the engineers who worked on the MH900, which is currently the largest robot made by Yaskawa here in the United States. They said they have one under construction and we'll get a chance to meet with some engineers and talk about it. Of course, six and a half hours gives you a lot of time to talk. And eventually we started to discuss how all of this came about. I'm just gonna apologize in advance for all the road noise. I feel very fortunate uh, to be in this situation. I happen to know a person who knows a person who knows a person. There's literally three person, people in this chain before we got to the person who knew about a machine that was probably still working, that was not being used. And through that chain of people, I made this connection where I'm driving almost seven hours to pick up this machine. It's pretty incredible. I can have access to industrial grade robotics, a machine that's been fully designed by a team of engineers with way more experience and knowledge than me. And uh, I can reverse engineer what they did and learn something from it. I want to tinkle with it. I want to figure out how it works and learn this machine. I get to share that with you guys and hopefully this will be on par with know anything a school could have done with it certainly if we get hundreds of thousands of people to watch these videos then many many people will benefit from this machine that might have been scrapped after a full day of driving, we finally made it to Ohio and we were ready the next morning to check out the facility. I didn't realize how big this place was until I walked into the parking lot and saw this 300,000 square foot facility. Good morning. How are you? I am well. We're here to see Clint. Okay. You guys want to get signed in? After tinkering with the robot in the lobby for a while, we got to shake some hands and started a tour. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go set up camp. Okay. And, uh... Oh, no. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I didn't know I was being introduced. <laughs> It's quite the welcome we get here. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Talk about this guy. Yeah, so this is the 1971. So this is literally flags and limit switches, chain driven ball screws for L and U access motors. You know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the dinosaur uh, display. <laughs> As you can see with all the cubicles, there's a lot of administrative staff here. There are engineers working here, designing parts. They provide a lot of their classes here for training with using their robots. There's also an entirely separate building full of robot parts and fully assembled robots ready to ship. With the exception of the MH900, as far as I know, most of the robots are built in Japan and then shipped here as a bare arm. At this facility, they manufacture the bases, they build rotary stations and work sales based on the customer specifications. Because there are a lot of customer products in this facility, many of which are proprietary products that they don't want shown on film, I opted to turn the camera off for large parts of the tour. Fortunately for you, you can see a more controlled tour that they did on their YouTube page, and I'll put a link to that in the description. In this video, we're gonna focus on the MH900, which was designed and built here in the United States, and of course, still being built. So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit and meet up with Kyle, who's gonna to talk to us about this MH900, which is under construction. So we got retractable fences, basically close off this area when we're doing testing. This robot is called the what now? The MH900. <laughs> this is the MH900, and what kind of capacity are we talking about? So the, the, it's in the name, the 900 kilograms is okay. its total payload, so uh, approximately 2,000 pounds or, or one ton. Kind of crouched down as you see now, again, like eight feet tall, but when it's kind of back up in its static home position that you see most robots, yeah. Um, that's about 12 feet up in the air. Got a reach of three to four meters. Just, just three to four meters. Three to four and meters. And at three to four meters, it's holding 900 kilograms. Correct. <laughs> so, and that's that's in part because of the hefty counterbalance we got on the back, which is literally just a block of iron. Okay. Uh, robot risers in the center, and Jeez, so man, that's a big base. That's only our two foot base. Uh, we <laughs> for full testing, when we were originally doing the prototype. We ended up using a seven foot tall riser so when we put the seven foot riser and then we had a 12 foot robot like in its home position the robot if it like kept reaching could hit the crane so it was always a, a matter of locking out our 15 ton crane and so you, you you basically put this on there just to swing it around to yep. test it that's the 900 kilogram weight we used another big one that was at least a 12 foot frame basically so we yep. could test the inertia on the the wrist axes so this is our, our ship position for for storage and so it does crouch down to about eight feet from floor to the top part up there yeah. so it is uh it requires a special truck to ship it it won't just fit in your normal semi truck the whole thing is 10,000 kilograms so it, it requires <laughs> quite a crane to lift for our test area specifically we also have a a three-foot structure of concrete and rebar underneath here to withstand the reaction forces as this robot <laughs> uh, went yeah. through its testing so this is dedicated concrete for the testing area. It's not bolted directly to concrete. It's an right. epoxied in steel plate that then we put a riser on with square washers to, to really clamp it down to the floor. It, it required a lot, of, a lot of effort that you wouldn't normally think of. All right, so one of the things I've always been curious about is this uh, component you have over here. Talk, talk to me about this. Yes, so- Because um, I see this on giant robots and I, I really, mm -hmm. well, I don't want to tell you what I think it does. I want you to, yeah, t t what, is, what does this do? <laughs> I'm curious what you think it does. Well, I feel like it's a hydraulic component that's helping to counteract the, you know, the weight of the arm. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it, it is not hydraulic. This okay. is actually what we call our spring balancer. Okay. So it is actually springs inside there that are compressed, holding back on the L arm. So it's one of the most dangerous components in it that you got to be careful with. There's a plate back here that ha holds the back of the springs, and that's okay. connected to the rod, and it'll basically expand or contract based on where this arm is. Really, this is assisting our motor. So our motor yeah. cannot hold this whole arm in this posture um, by itself. It can get close, but this is basically the, the extra little bit of assistance that you need. Yeah. Um, some robots do do it with uh, hydraulics or, or gas cylinders. Okay. Um, this is using a, a, a spring, and honestly, it's probably about as big as we'd ever go to a spring before really <laughs> considering something, some other solution. You said that you had one of these under construction somewhere, right? Can we see one somewhere in between? Yes, absolutely. Okay. What's so that? right here out of our test area is right there. <laughs> right behind it, okay. <laughs> right behind you is, this is our build platform. We built this yep. whole mezzanine simply because the robot's so tall, we need to get up there and not be working on ladders to install the upper arm. So this is one that is in about half constructed. 
So this is kind of the main body of the robot. Uh, we have a lift table here that allows us to raise up the whole robot, uh, work around it, get that, especially when we're working down low, it helps to have this more at a, a table height. That's the start, basically our motor will go in here and this is just kind of our, our own little handmade tool right now to turn turn it by so a you wrench. Can move it around. Yeah, yeah, so we can basically put a wrench on there and turn the whole S axis if we need to. But yeah. X axis, we're talking about rotating the base this Correct. direction. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and so then on the other side, we build our L axis, which is axis two. So okay. we call this the, the L axis, which means lower arm. Um, so this is the big main body casting. If you see over here, this yoke over here, this is kind of where that spring balancer we were talking about earlier exists. Yes. So that's where the big clevis is pinned. Um, and that's where kind of basically it is able to pull back on the arm and basically assist our motor in holding the, the torque. And then we also have our U-axis, which is the third axis. The way this robot's designed is we call it a parallel link system. When we're finally assembled, this secondary link is going to be parallel with the lower arm. So they'll always be in the same, same angle regardless. Yeah. And when you have your pivot points down here, as you rotate this down, the upper arm also moves with it. Well, one of the next steps we're doing is installing the, the cable harness, so the, the spine of the, the robot that yeah. allows control of the motors. And the more components you start putting on, the harder it is to access it. And when the harness yeah. itself is weighing upwards of 100 pounds, uh, it's a lot easier to do it in this stage when kind of everything's just open. Uh, and it's easy to fish the harness through our lower arm and just kind of leave the, the connections for our upper wrist axes to kind of just hang out for the moment. Yep. But it allows us to still kind of get in there, there and make the connections for uh, the lower three axes. Because then that's essentially it. So once you put that on, that's the, the top part of the arm. So how long done. does assembly usually take? We're not, a, we're not an assembly line, I'll say that. Right. So yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a big kind of made to order kind of project. In an ideal world when we're, everything's chugging along smooth and well, uh, it's probably about one month. Okay. Probably from yeah. start to finish to build. Then there would be uh, probably an additional week or so of preliminary testing. All in, I like to say about a month and a half, again, of all things going well. And we, it's, it's very hard to stock it too. So it's, <laughs> it's, we yeah. have limited floor space to be stocking it. For those who are watching, we are certainly not talking about the casting time and all the Correct. other time that Correct. goes into making and again, the so parts. <laughs> that, that one month time was assuming all the parts are here, ready, yes. in stock, no issues as we come along. Because uh, inevitably you run into issues as you're going along. It's, it, it, the sheer size of it has its challenges sometimes. I just wanted to pause here and highlight something he brings up, which is the sheer size of the robot adds all kinds of complexities. Designing a robot that can be assembled correctly and relatively quickly is already pretty challenging. But when you suddenly need cranes and special jigs to lift and move the components into place, that adds a whole new level of complexity to the manufacturing process. And you're gonna see that that becomes a theme throughout this entire interview. So our okay. castings are made locally, not in this facility, but we, right. we do use local USA foundries. There's a, a foundry that makes the raw casting yep. and then that sends to a, an external machine shop and then they do all the machining on the raw casting and then yep. it finally comes to us to put in our warehouse to stock and eventually pull out to build. So we don't build everything there a lot. Sometimes we have the smaller components built over here first. Some of the drives get built over here in their own individual stations. Uh, one of those stations is our upper arm. Now, when you say the drive, tell me what all is a part of that assembly? What are you calling the drive? Okay, so actually we got a good example here. So we kind of use this as a nice <laughs> visualization. It's, it's a very old drawing, but it was, it's a very nice, simple exploded view. But when I say a drive unit, I guess I'm talking about this is our Axis 1 drive, this is our Axis 2 or the L drive, and that's our Axis 3 or L or uh, U drive. Okay, so uh, I, I would say that you're talking about the motor, the gear, and the housing for the, for the yes. two. We, we, we consider that unit to be a drive. Yes. Okay. So what you see behind you is the upper arm sub-assembly. Okay. Um, so you got three motors. Uh, one thing we do have over here that's nice is because we don't have a full controller over here, we do have some test boxes that once we do have a motor installed and a whole drive unit assembled, we're able to hook up and at least have simple con jogging control so we can verify that, all right, when I turn here, I better make sure- I've got movement my, my, down there. My, my splines turn down there. Yeah. And so we also do uh, pressure testing over here. So we do have a, an airline going over down to the, the R axis drive. So what we do is before we ever put grease in the machines in, the, in each gearing drive, uh, we want to validate that there isn't a leak. So okay. it, it's always a combination of O-rings, oil seals, uh, some liquid gasket, 
Uh, basically, it's a we call it three bond, but it's a it's a, it's a putty that it cures yeah. after like 15 minutes, kind of like an epoxy. Um, so we kind of seal all of the possible leak joints, and then we pressurize each cow's drive, um, let it stabilize at a, at a certain pressure, and then we like let it hold, and we make sure that we're not losing pressure um, enough that we would justify it as a leak. And then, so, so sometimes the hardest part is finding that leak. If you can imagine looking at this, sometimes you got a leak that's just a pinhole, and yeah. you can't hear it, you can't feel it, <laughs> But it's there. The machine, the, our, our test equipment is sensitive enough to tell you, no, you are losing many, many pascals of, of leaking. Uh, and with this many holes in the device, and you're putting the liquid gasket on bolt threads sometimes and on a surface, and you're really hoping you do a good job. Um, <laughs> yeah. And in some cases, it works out great. In, in one case that we found earlier on this build, it took us a couple days to find, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, there was a pinhole in the casting. And sometimes that happens where the casting has porosity and there was a pinhole leak that was not in a seam that we would have ever thought to check. <laughs> so it was assembled correct that we couldn't find it until we like literally had to submerge the drive in water to see where the bubbles were. Because um, it, it's, it's very hard to find such a small leak. And in, in a real world, maybe it doesn't matter, but this is a very precise machine. Yeah. Uh, we don't want oil leaking out of it if we can help it. We have a high quality to meet and we want to make sure we're never leaking grease. <laughs> so yeah. we had the, the concentric torque tubes, what we call. And so we already have our R-axis engaged in this, uh, this part right here is that gear reduction. So now the second tube is coming out. This will be the spline for axis five. And then okay. this next tube comes out and this will be axis six, which then goes into our wrist unit, which you can see behind you. So this is about a 400, 500 kilogram wrist when it's officially assembled. Because of how many times we have to twist and orient this thing, we designed it a, a custom fixture. So this is one of our, our standard products at Yaskawa that we make here in the States is a, a headstock tailstock positioner. It, it's a nightmare. And when you have to access this almost from literally six sides as like a, like a cube, you can turn everything to kind of help you in some cases, but it is much more efficient to have something that can just turn it on a dime and just help you align things up easily the first time. So we'll eventually <laughs> insert a gear uh, so that that spline will go into another shaft that will then have its own other uh, helical gear on it that'll engage here and then turn this output. And that's how and that's this part of the casting can turn yes. around. And that's, that's our axis five. Axis six then gets a little more complicated as it comes through on that, I'm gonna say small spline, but <laughs> it's the smallest one. Yes. And then it's gonna engage in another series of gears to then get to a reducer that hasn't been put in yet to then turn the output face as well. I found this to be a really fascinating engineering problem. So you've got a shaft coming up through the middle. It's got a 90 degree gear on it so that it can come out this way and give us a gear on this side. There's a smaller gear meshed with it here and then a shaft coming back through and another 90 degree connection to turn the faceplate. But there's an interesting problem here. If you try to rotate axis number five, let's say we're moving it this way, well then this gear is going to start to roll around this gear, which will make it spin. And when this gear starts spinning, that's gonna spin your faceplate, moving whatever you're holding with the robot out of position. So they compensate for this by actually rotating this gear in the opposite direction while they're moving axis number five, and therefore they can keep the faceplate exactly what they want. Or even more complicated, if they're moving both axis number five and axis number six, the software is compensating to keep the part exactly where you want it. And that to me is fascinating. Initially, yeah. you're like, how am I gonna get all the way to the final stage here when two other axes can turn before all that? All the motors are actually turning, even if you're not like saying, I want the, the final axis to turn, yeah. it still has to turn to compensate if the other axes are moving. I'm always impressed with the software behind our systems and yeah. our controller that is smart enough to know what to do for that and <laughs> as a mechanical engineer a lot of that is kind of like <laughs> magic to me but I'm always yeah. impressed at our controls so uh, originally when I started out I, I came right out of college uh, was, was assigned to this project which was a, a multi-engineer team effort it, right, it was, right. it's not it cannot be a one man there's too many details uh, <laughs> something would get easily missed yeah. one of my first jobs again out of college was kind of all right, here, the design is being scaled up from a, a, a past design that Japan had. The, the rule is kind of if the part's over 50 pounds, it, it needs assistance. It can't be done like that day in and day out if someone's assembling. So a lot of the parts that in Japan 
they might have just lifted and installed or they might have they might have a little jig to lift something they, you know even these this is would probably be impossible even on a medium-sized robot to easily lift and insert right. correctly um, but a lot of like little things just suddenly became oh I need a specific lifting fixture or I need yeah. a specific rest fixture uh, you know, this this arm can get assembled here and it needs something that's strong enough to hold hundreds and hundreds of pounds of of tubes and castings and gearboxes yeah. that normally you could just put on a table but we needed special fixtures uh, we needed special spanner bars it, it became a series of challenges and you know it, it was a huge learning opportunity there are still fixtures here that probably work but could yeah. be improved over time uh, and we're always improving as we go through it and go well that we got it done, but it wasn't the, the smoothest and cleanest operation. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I have the, the open honesty of all the technicians telling me when something doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you, <Yeah>. guys. <laughs> um, and so and we try and make it better uh, as often as we can. So the very first prototype had several, <laughs> several instances of like, well, sometimes we need to take something apart. Yeah. And so we had designed of, oh, this will go together like this. And it's a super precise fit. And then all of a sudden you get the question of, how do I get that back apart if I need to get that apart? And there's yeah. a lot of like, oh no, that, is, that went together one way and it's it's not easy to come apart and I don't have the, or I don't have the tool, like I needed the tool to like, get it in. How do you in. hold on to it to move it or how do you, and yeah, now it's jack bolts. Jack bolts, <laughs> jack bolts are one of the, <laughs> it was the saving things that it's just. I want to see the controller box. Okay. We'll have yeah. them over, they're over here. They're, so this is actually probably the perfect example of this is so again, this is our, our DX200 controller. So it's a generation behind what we sell today, which is our okay. YRC1000 controller. Um, so we, we kind of started this as the guts, but the problem is we needed larger amplifiers on yeah. this, the lower three axes. <laughs> so this controller got expanded to then have this larger cabinet butt up against it. Um, okay, that makes so more when sense. When they are combined, because uh, <laughs> when I saw this, I was like, I don't think that's big enough either. But no, now no, no. I know that they're together. Yeah. Okay, that makes so, sense. <laughs> I'm going to spare you my super nerdy motor control questions here, and let's fast forward to the next section. <laughs> but it's it's a mammoth controller uh, to power a mammoth robot. At this point, we decided to transition the conversation to the conference room. And we continue to talk about robot design and manufacturing, but there's something else I want to share with you here. And that's this constant feeling I was experiencing as I walked around with these experienced engineers who are in this room full of commercially built robots. There was just this unbelievably powerful sense of being so far out of my league. If you're not a subscriber, then you might not know that I recently finished building a robot in my garage and uh, it was quite the challenge. There was so much I didn't know I really knew almost nothing about robotics. In fact, I'd never even been in the same room with a robot. So yes, I'm a total amateur, but at the same time, if I had not tried to build that robot, I wouldn't even be sitting in this in this room today. Whenever doing a project like this, there's, there's always a temptation to feel like you need to have all the knowledge. You need to be the best welder or the best machinist or you know an expert programmer. You need to have all the electrical knowledge before you start. And I am not an expert in any of those things. It's fascinating to me how trying first, just going out there, knowing that I wasn't gonna be the best machinist or the best welder or the best whatever. And I, I struggled through this project and you can watch the whole series and see it happen. And yet here we are, right? I'm sitting in a room with these amazing engineers and learning so much from their experience. Walking around this place and seeing 30 years of engineering culminated in one precision machine is really just incredible. And I only have this opportunity because I, I tried. So anyway, let's go back to the interview and pick it up in the conference room. What made Yaskawa say, we need a bigger one? Like, how did that come about? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, when we look at a robot company, industrial robot company as a whole, we look at a suite of robot solutions from small payload to big payload, from application-based, whether it's spot welding, welding, material handling, plasma cutting. This was one of the holes in our product line that we needed to fill. We didn't have a large, super big capacity robot that could reach up to a second story mezzanine and pull down auto bodies 
and lower them yeah. down to production floors. They're already buying our welding robots and material handling robots and spot welding robots, <laughs> but if they want to move something big around, they got to buy somebody else's. So we wanted to take that, you know, that excuse away, if yeah. you will. That was the genesis of the MH900. Like, what, what, are you, what were some of your big learning moments with this project? At? that stand out for you? A lot of it, again, was early on, I was doing a lot of fixturing design, and a lot of it sometimes came down from, I'm seeing pictures, yeah. o only pictures of some tool that exists <laughs> for the smaller robots on what they did, and it said, and it's like, okay, so I gotta somehow make that, I have no drawings, I'm just like looking at it going, I think that's how they're using this tool, <laughs> and some of the tools like are very homegrown, yes. <laughs> is, is the word I'll use. and. So, because they would even, I'd ask sometimes, they go, we don't have a drawing for that. We welded this wrench handle onto that 20 years ago and it still works. Yeah. And it's like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's okay. Those, sometimes those are the best tools. And yeah, they, those and are it the works. Most perfect tools. And it, it's like, and that's wow, why I'm that laughing because I yeah. know how, yeah. <laughs> and it, it was like a great, like, oh, they grab that wrench handle and they, they lift it with a crane and they steer it and it goes in. And it's awesome. <laughs> I got to do that. <laughs> it's kind of, we were using. Uh, you know, Japanese work instructions, all in Japanese. Uh, and thankfully we have <laughs> engineers and we had the videos. The videos ended up helping a lot because we, we saw it. But again, sometimes you see something and it's like, yeah. okay, great, they did that. But boy, it looked like they're struggling. And now we're like doubling the weight of that part. <laughs> so it's already yes. two guys like ugh, getting that casting on. Now we got to do that by ourselves with you know, the cranes we need. We had giant easel boards basically where as as each day we built we would start writing notes on this didn't work and here's what yeah. we think we can do to fix it or uh this this was not ideal to, to assemble this way we need to fix it so there was a whole after the dust had settled there was a whole month of like all right go back update every design before we go buy production level quantities right. of any part and make sure it's all synchronized too that's that's the trick is you know i change one part but sometimes the other part needs to also <laughs> change and we need to make sure that all of that synced up correctly a lot of the uh things you got to think about is is when you think about castings casting size can vary like five to ten millimeters depending on the size of the casting so you might wow. have a perfect model here and you go oh yeah that's gonna be fine and then you got to go oh do i have enough if, if that is a little thicker when it comes <laughs> off the mold they're not going to grind that down unless i tell them to so it's where, what areas do I need to make sure I say, nope, I don't care if it, you know, just make even an air cut. And just, if you remove material, great. I just need, as like a safety barrier of like, I need to make sure there is at least five millimeters of clearance because this whole arm's gonna rotate through this area. If it's an unmachined area, it could be yeah. five millimeters thicker than it is in the model. Is that still okay? And so you have to find like the smallest points and then keep that in your mind and go, what if both castings are oversized? Will they will they overhit or something? Well, is it always oversized? Can it be undersized? It as can well? also be undersized. Castings are they're great and they make some really awesome shapes. But it, you're pouring liquid metal into a, a sand casting kind of thing, and and that can change a little bit, just a little. But it, it's enough to sometimes be critical when you're talking about inter interferences. Was it intimidating to step into the design of? the next step of that legacy of extreme durability and reliability. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We did positioners, which are also, again, highly precise, yeah. um, and, but they're only up to three axes. Um, Certainly and, simpler in comparison. And, and a little bit yeah. simpler, yeah. And, and they're, they're great, reliable products. And, and then this, and it's to our, well, we felt comfortable. It was our design in America, so we, you know, we felt good about, we, could, we were controlling our own design here. Uh, and so for then this robot, we had a lot of um, basically not surveillance, but you know we're being observed that right. you know we're we're responsible for Yaskawa's level of quality when it comes to the robotic element, um, and so that had set a very high standard that we had to hit of quality, of design, of, of doing the math behind the scenes and, and making sure that this design stood up to the quality and legacy that you said of all of Yaskawa's. Uh, line up until that point. And so for them to trust us with that, there was obviously a lot of, well, we're trusting you. We had two Japanese engineers again helping us that had spent years in their headquarters in Japan and so they knew their stuff. It was a, a challenge and you wanted to make sure that all eyes are on it, so <laughs> don't mess up.
<laughs> yeah. I had one final question that had been burning in my mind, and that is, how do you decide to use multiple robots and what goes into designing these work cells where you have two and three robots all coordinated and working together? At the trade show, we saw this robot that had uh, a robot assembly station. Yeah, it was it was a DR2C, so dual robot, two controller. That's uh, our lingo for multiple robot access control. And so this thing had, you had a rolling axis for moving the part and two robots that could weld. Tell me about that, because you started to talk about the controller and that's the interesting part I want yeah, to get back so to. Yeah, so that's our ArcWorld product. Right. And so our ArcWorld product has those three main components. It is a positioner system of some size, shape, or form, a safety enclosure, uh, typically a fence with some well, arc flash coating on it, and then an array of robots, either one to you know, up to five, six, seven robots can be in, in one system. And so our controller is basically thinks it's, it's a six axis system or a 12 axis system or an 18 axis system all the way up to a 72 axis system. So it's still one teach pendant and I am controlling each one of those robots through a single point of control. And robots are justified by, you know, what is the cycle time do you need? How many, how many inches of weld wire in a welding application, how many inches of weld wire do I need to put on this part? And how many parts do I need to produce in an hour or produce yeah. in a day? And it's simply a division of how many torches I need to place on that part. And I back into my system design based on what my part needs are. So I don't flippantly grab four robots and throw four <laughs> robots in the system in front of a positioner and say, okay, hey, check it out, you'll love it. You know, that's, that's not what we do, right? Yeah. We really start with the production requirements and what do you need and how fast do you need those parts and how many inches of weld wire and divide that by how many torches we need to, to produce. So that's how you get to a d dual arm system or a quad system or a bridge that we span over the top and we wall mount four robots and we floor <laughs> mount four rods. We have eight robots, you know, or, you know, six, seven, whatever, how many robots attack a part at one time. If that's the, if that's the solution, what was the question, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, a cool I, solution. Well, how'd you get there? You know, that's almost more exciting to talk about. That's an interesting thought because yeah. as, as I'm thinking backwards from what you just said about yeah, obviously that brings a lot of complexity and cost because you're buying all the robots. Yeah. So what if you, if it could be done by one robot on a track, let's say, that would be a more affordable and simpler option in oh, terms yeah. of programming. Where do you, where do you cross that threshold? Is it, is it just cycle time or what, what other differences are there that would make you say, you really need two robots for this, or you really need four robots for this? Yeah, another great question. This is, this is where, you know, industrial engineering comes into play, you yeah. know? Where is that crossover point? And, mm -hmm. and, and how, how many, what is the duty cycle of that one poor robot running up and down a track, you know, burning thousands of inches of, of weld wire as fast as you can to say, you know what? my system will last longer if I split this. And so, yeah, you have to take into all of those factors. Wow, you know, I it's, it's not a duty cycle. Like, yeah. There's so many variables that you yeah. can just drop from your mind. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and even in electrical design, you know, we, we, we have a safety factor. So we want to take those same kind of buffers in, into mechanical design and what we do from that standpoint as well. It's not an easy question to answer. There's, there's <laughs> right. no yes or no answer. There's, there's a lot of factors you have to bring in. That, get, that brings up the next topic is a, a lot of these multiple robot configurations deal with deformation and warpage of the parts. If I weld on one end of the part and I go to the other end of the part, that part on the other end of the that part on the other end, by the time I get there, is not going to be in the original position it was bolted to. I have all kinds of things that could happen to that end of that part. So I have seam tracking, I have seam finding, I have all these other softwares on top of that to locate that. But I can mitigate the deformation and warpage by putting heat in two opposite locations at the same time time and yeah. relatively heat up the part so now I don't have quite the programming spaghetti to go <laughs> go go try to track and find all right yeah. now I can put a second robot or I can put a third and a fourth robot and start my weld process and walk around a part with four separate robots and get away with a lot less complexity yeah. because I'm I am controlling that heat input 
you know, globally for the entire part at the same time. So those are some other, you know, additional complexities of my part process to justify how many robots are. Yeah, I need this many inches of weld wire per part and I need to execute at so many parts per day, but I can, I can affect my quality and of yeah. my part production by controlling this heat issue. So there's another variable to have in the back of your mind when you're designing a system. Thank you for yeah. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to talk with us, and uh, this has been great, man. I learned yeah. a lot. No problem. Yeah. I enjoy sharing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good talking with you, Kyle. Yeah. yeah, that was great. After we finished the interviews, it was time to go pick up this salvage robot. The only thing we know about this robot for sure is that it was capable of jogging around the last time they turned it on. So it's totally up to me to figure out how well it works. Now is a good time to point out that this robot that they're offering me is not part of any sort of sponsorship. There were no strings attached. I wasn't required to make a video or tell you guys anything about what we're doing here. But after they told me I would get a chance to talk with engineers, see the MH900 under construction and tour the facility, I requested permission to videotape that experience and share it with you guys. And we almost got the shorter truck. <laughs> so glad I gave myself a little extra. <laughs> we are uh, really cramming it in there. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Jim, so, yeah, man. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> if you made it this far, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I had a lot of fun learning about the MH900 and getting to talk to these engineers about how robotics is done at the commercial level. There are many hurdles I have left before I can actually use this robot for anything. For example, it's 480 volts three phase. I need to figure out how to operate this thing. I need to figure out how it's currently wired, all the inputs and outputs. So there's a lot of reverse engineering left, but I am definitely looking forward to the journey. Once we get that done, we will have a new tool in the shop in order to make teaching videos and learn more about engineering. Anyway, thanks for watching. It's looking pretty insane in here, <laughs> but we got it all inside. Oh, geez. There's a lot of work to be done. All right, sir. Good job. Have thanks. a good night. You too.